Hello and welcome to this podcast from the BBC World Service. Please let us know what you think and tell other people about us on social media. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. This year, 21 members of the various families have turned up. Yeah. 21 members of the family is nothing. I once <laughs> had lunch at one of my aunt's houses and there were 66 people there for lunch. I wow. had my lunch sitting on someone's bed. Uh, happily, I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the washing up. <laughs> <laughs> Leading the conversation on the global game. This is World Football on the BBC World Service. Hello, I'm Manny Jasmine. Welcome to the programme. And uh, the first bit of exciting news is that the descriptions of Pat Nevin and Heather O'Reilly have changed because during the European Championship, Pat was veteran of Euro 92, Pat Nevin. Now he's just plain old former Chelsea and Everton <laughs> winger, Pat Nevin. Whereas Heather has been upgraded to three times Olympic gold medalist because the Olympics are on. And speaking of the Olympics, Heather... I don't really know how to put this, but um, are you quite pleased that the Olympic football competition began while you were asleep? <laughs> I have to make a confession here. I set my alarm for 4.20 to wake up for a 4.30 kickoff between USA and Sweden, and I didn't make it. Um, yeah, so very <laughs> difficult times to watch some of these matches going on in Japan, unfortunately, for us in the well, US. Well, your guardian angel was looking after you because it finished not one, not two, but three nil to Sweden. Have you ever, have you seen any of the highlights? Can you, I mean, what do you know about that match? Yeah, I, I've, I've gotten the full recap and, and seen a lot of the highlights. I woke up and my husband said they got thrashed three nil. And I thought he was joking. He's like, I'm not joking. Check it out. So, I mean, they just came out completely flat. It's hard to say one thing that went wrong. It's one of those matches where it seems like everything goes wrong. They didn't come out to play. Sweden was all over them pressure-wise. Um, they weren't able to possess the ball like they usually do. And I just think that it was such a knock of confidence. Um, they got scored against on a few set pieces. And again, it was just um, one of those games where it's just like you can't you can't get going. You can't get out of the gate. Um, so, yeah, d definitely a humbling loss. But as we've spoken about, Sweden has been a thorn in the side of the U.S. for, for many tournaments now. But um, the U.S. generally rises to the occasion. Unfortunately, it didn't last Olympics, but... The goal now has to just be get out of the group and then take it one game at a time and get it done. So that shifts. You know, I don't think anybody expected get out of the group would be our goal. But now that is the goal of the U.S. national team. Well, away from the Olympics, Pat has very kindly interrupted his holiday to come on the program. Are you in some amid some rugged Scottish landscape, a, a, a rock filled island? Where are you, Pat? <laughs> Yeah, I kind of am. Um, it's lovely. It's an island of Arran. And maybe some people around the world may have heard a song by Paul McCartney and Wings called Mull of Kintyre. Well, I could drive a golf ball into the Mull of Kintyre where I am sitting talking to you right now. So it's beautiful Scottish mountains and seaside. And uh, yes, a lovely place to be. But no, I did not want to miss talking to yourselves in world football. And also, when I found <laughs> out that the USA got beat, I thought, well, I want to hear what Heather's got to say about it. Because <laughs> is that a 44-match running since the last defeat? I mean, 44 matches. And then it comes, you know, a 3-0 a three like that. That's absolutely incredible. And I think there's some suggestion, Manny, you were saying to me that it was Abby Wambach who tweeted last thing you mm. want to be now is the next opponent to this team. Um, and I'll, I need to ask Manny and indeed Heather. She also said, nobody puts baby in the corner. Eh? Yeah, I was going <laughs> to ask you about that, Heather. What does that mean? Oh, you guys don't know. Oh, no. Oh, no, strangely enough, we don't. A uh, classic American film called Dirty Dancing. Oh, can I, Dancing. Can I jump in? Can, oh, no, right, okay. I was going to jump in Yeah, it's from because, Dirty Dancing uh, with Patrick Swayze. Ah, right. And it's basically a reference of, like, don't limit us. 
because Baby was the main character in the movie, and she essentially was told to sit in the corner and behave herself. And so she's just saying, you know, nobody puts the U.S. in the corner and expects them to stay there. They're going to come out with a vengeance. Right, okay. Right. And I'm just, I know this is a football program, <laughs> not a movie program, but it might have actually also come from another movie called Bringing Up Baby by Catherine Hepburn, and Baby was a leopard. So you wouldn't put that baby in the corner either. <laughs> but has the leopard dimmed its spots, Heather? <laughs> is it too old? Uh, from from somebody that's 36 years old and is still contemplating an epic comeback you know i (laughs) i have to say no i mean and by the way sweden is likely the second oldest team in the tournament they aren't exactly young whippersnappers themselves either so sweden also goes with a very experienced team a lot of players that have you know 50 100 caps i don't think that that's the problem I, I do think for the next World Cup in two years from now, there's going to need to be some fresh blood. But for this tournament itself, I still have a lot of faith in, in the old guard to get it done. But we'll see. Speaking of the old guard, a uh, word on a couple of uh, venerable, aged players who are still going strong. Christine Sinclair made her 300th international appearance for Canada and scored in their one all draw with Japan while at the age of 43, Formiga played in her seventh Olympic Games. She's played in every single Olympics where women's football has taken place. Both of those started before you did, Heather, and they're still going after you finished. (laughs) Well, don't make me competitive, Manny. (laughs) Um, No, absolutely unbelievable what those two women have accomplished. Formiga, I mean, seven Olympic Games. That's just unbelievable. It's like she uh, she's a fine wine. She keeps getting it, getting the job done. And, you know, Christine Sinclair is a striker. She's a goal scorer. So for her to be doing it for so long and with so much consistency um, is very impressive. I mean, I wouldn't say more or less, but, you know, a lot of older players are center backs or maybe holding midfielders where maybe the demand of um, sprinting, Uh, repetitive sprints is a little bit less. But for Christine Sinclair to put in that kind of shift and produce for that many years is incredible. And uh, and hats off to them and best of luck in the tournament, unless, of course, they're playing the mighty USA. (laughs) (laughs) And and a word for Barbara Banda, the uh, Zambian striker. There was a remarkable game which would have had more attention had the USA not been thrashed by Sweden. Uh, she scored a hat trick in a 10 3 defeat. And not only that, she scored a hat trick, but Vivian Miedema for the Netherlands, whom Zambia were playing, scored four. So poor old Barbara probably didn't even get the match ball. But I mean, it's, when was the last time you saw a 10 <laughs> 3? I once played in a 5 3, and uh, there was a hat trick scored on both sides. So if you lose. And you scored a hat trick. I, I don't think you walk off your head down. You still walk off your <laughs> no. head up. But um, Barbara Banda, her goals were arguably as good as Miedema's. Yeah, I, th- I thought her goals were fantastic. And up against a real quality side like the Dutch, the defending we have to say from Zambia was that they left a lot to be desired. However, Barbara, she looked fantastic. And uh, I think some European teams might be looking at her now. She's playing over in China, I believe. But she looked the business. That wasn't a fluke. Three goals. She's a very good young player. And knowing Mirama, if Mirama did get the match ball for having four, she probably gave it over to Barbara because she is yeah. a humble player. And uh, probably yeah, got a what a bizarre scoreline. I mean, if your team is going to give up 10 goals, it's usually 10 nil game. Uh, yeah. So for her to get a hat trick is unbelievable. So yeah, a kind of a crazy one, but hats off to her. Well, sticking with African football, last weekend, Egyptian club El Ahli won the African Champions League for a record 10th time and the second in less than a year. And equally impressive is the record of the club's South African coach, Pizzo Mosimane. This was his third Champions League success after having won it with Mamelodi Sundowns in 2016. 
Add those to a clutch of league titles and taking Al Ahly to third place in last year's Club World Cup, and the 56-year-old has a CV which few in Africa can match. I've been speaking to him this week, and we'll get to the impact of apartheid on his life and his possible ambitions for coaching in Europe later. But first, what is it like to coach a giant club like Al Ahly? It's an honor and a privilege to coach the biggest team, uh, the club of the century in the continent because of uh, the numbers of al I mean, they're boasting that they have 70 million plus supporters in the population of uh, Egypt. Even Europe doesn't have that, let's be honest, uh, because 70 million is more than the population of my country in South Africa. And al supporters are not in Egypt only, they're all over the world. I was humbled when I was Never even coach of Alakli. I was still the coach of my former team when I went to holiday with my wife to, to Thailand. I met Alakli supporters on the streets, they stopping me because they recognize you because you played against Alakli. You played against a team called Zamalek. So that's how huge the team is. What's the secret of your success? I'm from a different culture. I'm from a different religion. And he's the first coach from... Sahara to coach Alakli. I mean, Alakli is, is a team established in 1907. They always have European and South Americans and coaches from everywhere. There's only one principle I believe in. You can't lead people and make people to buy your story or buy your vision when you don't understand the people. So I first have to understand the person, what he likes, what he doesn't like, how does he think. That's important. And when the person realizes that you are closer to him you are trying to help him to get the best you are fair you are honest in your work whether they like you or not it doesn't matter what color of the skin you are they will buy into the story because you have to be truthful to what you're doing so i think the human part is is the most important thing you get to get closer to the players remember they are the ones who are playing we don't play as coaches they are the ones who are playing so you must have that relationship what was your upbringing like as a black child in apartheid South Africa? And how has that influenced you, the man? Yeah, I mean, we grew up in a mesh box. We call them South Africa mesh box houses, four roomed house, one kitchen, one bedroom, one living room and one dining room. And we, we, we end up converting wherever to be bedrooms so that uh, because we are big families, you know, I suffered a lot uh, and opportunities that we didn't get. Anybody of my age at that time with a different color skin was or had an opportunity better than me. But I think that is an advantage in a way mentally because you aspire. You can't say, oh, I was oppressed before and hence I am in this situation. You're no longer oppressed now. So it's open for us now. You must always find an opportunity in a challenge. So the challenge of going under apartheid has given me an opportunity to say that you can do better than you were before and, and nothing can stop you from getting anything irrespective of your upbringing, whether we grew up being poor or not. It doesn't matter. Football is football. Football doesn't care about your color. Football doesn't care. Look at the whole of Brazilian stars that come from favelas. Look at uh, the Sergio Manes and Mohamed Salah. We all come from those conditions. So football gives us an opportunity and a break to break barriers. What about your standing as such an, a successful coach and such a successful African how do people regard you now after winning so many competitions yeah well sometimes I've been viewed as the most successful African coach uh, a black coach and I, I don't like that I think I'm an international coach I'm not a black coach I've competed at the World Cup I've competed at the Confederation Cup I've been to the FIFA Club World Cup twice so I would like to be considered as, as a football person I'm very lucky to be in Egypt. People uh, appreciating my job. You go to the North Africa and you even go to Qatar. People know you. It's beyond the continent. You said that you have become the first sub-Saharan African to coach Al Ahly. Is the next step for you to go to Europe, where clubs have traditionally stuck with European and South American coaches? Uh, it's very difficult to go to Europe because we have to be honest, honest and, and be fair. How many coaches do you know, black coaches from Africa in Europe? Never say never, and you have to be positive. You must also look at the reality. I'm not infatuated in coaching in Europe 
Because what are my chances? Equal opportunities. They're never there. It's not how much you, you, what you do and what you do. It's somebody to give you an opportunity. So you need the team owner to give you an opportunity. How frustrating is it though, Pizzo, that you can be as successful as you want, but eventually you can't go any further? I don't want to be sound the guy who's very bitter about this. We are happy to coach in Africa, you know, and we are happy to welcome them from Europe to come and, and, and share a slice of the cake with us, only if they can up our, our levels of education. If the coaches are coming in Africa, they don't improve us and they don't help us, then what's the point? Just before we finish, uh, I must ask you this question. Why is your nickname Jingles? <laughs> I got the nickname from one football player, a Portuguese guy who lives in South Africa. His name is Jingles Pereira. He was a player for our local team, Keto Chiefs. He was well known and I really loved the guy as a football player. Everybody knew that I liked the guy and they started calling me Jingles and I like, why not? It's a good, it's a good name. And by the way, I met the guy in, uh, in Russia for the World Cup and he came up to me. He says, Jingles, how are you? I said, who's this guy who's calling me Jingles here in Russia? And by the way, Jingles is only known amongst the, the black people. He says, do you know who I am? I said, no, he was wearing a Portuguese shirt. He says, just think it's Jingles Pereira. Oh, I said, okay. <laughs> I gave up. I said, uh, that's the real Jingles, not me. I was so honored to meet him. I hugged him. I said, oh, I really admire you. And thanks for the nickname. Al Ahli coach Pitsu Mosimane. Pat, Mosimane talks about the struggles of apartheid acting as a motivating factor for him to create a better life for himself. But his tone of hopelessness when he was talking about moving to European football as a black man was really striking to hear. Is the difficulty of black coaches being hired by European clubs really a bigger barrier than apartheid was? I mean, it's an incredible thought, isn't it? If he's saying that and believes that, and if it is the case, it's quite horrifying. Um, it's incredibly difficult for any African coaches to, to make that change because, as he said, and I think the, my, the line that sticks with me is opportunity. Never given the opportunity. We don't know if, how many of the African coaches are going to be good enough if you never give anybody a chance. And you know what you'll, uh, all these clubs will say, the big clubs will say, well, well, it is taking a chance. We don't want to take a chance. But if you look at someone like Pizzo and what he's done, is it that much of a chance, really? You know, he has been a successful coach. He's coached top quality players. And it kind of wouldn't really matter where they were, whether it would be in Africa, whether it be in Europe, you know. And I just hope, I mean, it will happen. It will happen. It's just taken an incredibly long time. And I do feel... Very sorry. If I go all the way back to people like Joe Mosono, who was a phenomenal player, but also was involved in a, a bit of coaching as well, and should have been a household name all around the world, but never was given the chance through apartheid, and then through because he was another black man from Africa who didn't get the opportunity in the top levels of European football. So yeah, it's been there for a long time. I suspect it's still there now, and I will not be surprised if it's still there for a long time to come. And that's very saddening indeed. Heather, does the glass ceiling to which he alluded sound depressingly familiar to you as a woman in any context, not just football? I think there's a lot of similarities between some racial barriers that he was referring to and what we face as being a woman. And and let's just speak in, in the coaching realm, because, you know, has there been a female coach of the Premier League? No, there hasn't. Will there be in our lifetime? Well, I don't know. Pat, mm-hmm. what do you think? In our lifetime, will there be a female a, coach of the Premier League? It's only a maybe. I mean, I, 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 I'm a positive person. I hope so, I think. But basically, there, there will be good enough coaches. There, there will be coaches, yeah. and there probably are coaches already yeah. who are good enough to be Premier League coaches and are women. But that's a different question, isn't it? <laughs> and I don't know the answer. I hope and pray. But that's the most I can give you, Heather. I hope. Yeah. Uh, And and so, yeah, I I do think that it's similar. I think that opportunity, uh, people taking a chance is what, you know, females need in coaching. It means, you know, having some people be trailblazers. You know, you look at Emma Hayes, for example. Could she be the first one? Could she be a trailblazer? And, And then when she does get that spot, you know, would you critique her fairly? And hold her to the same standards, not more, not less, but the same standards 
as a male coach. So yes, I do think that there's a lot of similarities and, and, and hopefully we'll just continue to, to chip away and, and these opportunities will come for, for Pitso, for people like Emma Hayes, uh, myself who, you know, dreams one day of, of being a manager at a high level. But that chipping away, I think, is so frustrating for people because it's very, very slow. Um, so hopefully we can, uh, we can speed that up. You're listening to World Football on BBC World Service. I'm Manny Jasmine. Pat Nevin and Heather O'Reilly are also here. And now to the CONCACAF Gold Cup, which is currently taking place in the United States, involving national teams from North and Central America and the Caribbean, plus Qatar, who have been playing in all kinds of non-Asian competitions as they prepare to host the World Cup. And this weekend, in the quarterfinals, Qatar will face El Salvador. If El Salvador win, they'll make history by reaching the semi-finals of the competition for the first time. The Salvadorans, impressed in their group stage, only losing narrowly 1-0 to Mexico in their last match. Their coach, Hugo Perez, is a naturalised American and since taking over in April has set high standards of fitness and results. That Mexico defeat was his first. But the atmosphere in the Cotton Bowl Stadium in Dallas will stay for a long time with striker Joaquin Rivas. It was unbelievable. I couldn't even, I could barely even hear myself. Now imagine like <laughs> trying to speak on the field and whatnot, but it was obviously definitely... One of my favorite experiences by far in my career. So uh, obviously the result didn't go in our way, but I thought we definitely deserved more. But no, it's definitely almost I can't even explain it how how meaningful that game was to all of us, really. What's your story? You were born in El Salvador, but you speak with a very American accent. So did you grow up there? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I was was born in Santana, Salvador, then raised in Las Vegas since I was four or five years old. So I went to school, obviously, in the States, and that's why I have a pretty good accent. <laughs> <laughs> How did you fall in love with football? Uh, my my dad, mainly, obviously. my it's, it's ran all throughout my family, but my dad was definitely the one that, ever since I was a little boy, I always carried the soccer ball and I always went to go watch his games. And he's definitely my idol, obviously, and... I'm glad that he's out in the stands right now and, and he's enjoyed every moment as well. And I'm able to play in front of my family and when I just, it's a very special meaning to me. How connected are you to your roots? I mean, uh, you know, after your family moved to the States, did you, did you go back to El Salvador? Are you, uh, are you, are you do you have relationships with your extended family? Actually, the first time I got called up in 2018 was the first time I went back since I was born. Really? Yeah. So every time that I've gone there, it's been because of a call up. And I definitely want to go, obviously, for a vacation and explore a bit, see, obviously, where my roots came from and whatnot. And I've heard many good things about it. And it's definitely on my list. But uh, it's it's definitely a different world out there. And then I'm very, very blessed to obviously see both sides of it. And um I, I learned to appreciate more of like what I'm, what I have in the in the states and whatnot compared to what's in El Salvador. So, what does playing for the national team of El Salvador mean to you, um, who has hardly ever been there? It's a, it's something that as a boy you always dream of, you know, playing for your national team and being able to represent your country. That you know, we it might be a small country, but to us it means means a lot, a lot more than that. So. It's a blessing, like I said earlier, and and I'm very pleased with how everything is going and hopefully it gets even better in the future. That's a really interesting thing that you said, that you grew up wanting to play for your country and your country being El Salvador. What was it about your Salvadoran heritage that made you think of it as being your country, even though you grew up somewhere else? Like I mentioned, it was just with my family. We would all watch the games together when I was younger as well, you know, when El Salvador played the U.S. or Honduras or Mexico and whatnot. And we always like they always joked around and said, like, that would be you one day or that, you know, like that. And obviously I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. And now that I grew up and it happened, it's just it's more meaningful and obviously being being able to do it. And then now, you know, my family is. Like I said, they mean the world to me, and then I'm glad that they have supported me since day one, and it's it's a very, very special meaning to me. 
even though I've been in the States pretty much all my life, I will always consider myself Salvadorian. And I always say that, yes, I am Salvadorian and that is in my blood. And I'm just really honestly proud of it. I'm never going to say I'm not. It's just something that, like I said, like with my family and stuff like that, we're all, we've all been very close on that and we're not really afraid to say it, you know. Going back to the Mexico game, which was uh, the most recent one, all the reports I've read in the uh, online have said that El Salvador played without fear against Mexico. And Mexico, the biggest football country in the region, it's not often that a team plays against them without fear. I read one quote which said Mexico won the match, but El Salvador won respect. What's in the spirit of your team that made you play like that? First half, I think we just, we came out a bit nervous, I would say, and it obviously showed. And going into halftime, we definitely said, you know, we have to come out without fear, like how you mentioned. And we pressed them. It worked out, it worked in our favor. I thought, like I said, we deserved a goal or two, just like they had chances. I think we could have tied or maybe even won the game. But definitely it's not easy because Mexico, I do consider them the best in CONCACAF. And for them to not be able to know what to do in the second half, I thought was unexpected really because many were thinking, hey, like Mexico is going to put five against El Salvador, you know, as, as expected, that's what they always say. But I thought we proved ourselves and to prove to many people that what we're capable of, we proved it that we're capable of a lot. Qatar, next game. How are you seeing the Qatar game? Very good opponent. Definitely have respect for them. They're good players, very, very fast on the counter as well. They're, it's a reason why they're doing so well in the tournament because they're the champions of Asia. So we definitely know that. And we know that we have to come out flying as well and match that. But uh, no, like I said, we're motivated, we're confident in what we're doing. And I think, uh, I think it's going to be a good game. And I think uh, we're trying to obviously not just do history one more by being the first team to make into the semifinals in the Gold Cup. Uh, obviously make it to the final as well and have a chance to win. So it would mean a lot to us. El Salvador striker Joaquin Rivas preparing for their big quarterfinal match at the weekend. Pat and Heather, let's start with you, Pat. What's the best atmosphere you've ever played in? Ooh, London derbies were good. you against uh, Chelsea, against Spurs, Arsenal, Liverpool, Everton. Absolutely fantastic as well. Even one of them being at uh, Wembley, which was great. Even a Scotland-England game. But I'm going to tell you, no, I played at the Aztec Stadium for Scotland against Mexico, under 20s. I could not <laughs> believe the noise. It was incredible. So Mexican fans, and we're just talking about them there, that was the most incredible atmosphere I have ever come across in my, my life. And I just wish I could have played in that atmosphere and even further south in South America a little bit more in my career. For me, I, I would I would split it between international matches and, and club. I think for club matches on on the women's side, Portland actually in the U.S. is is the best atmosphere that I've played in. Uh, it holds twenty five thousand, and they sell out every game. Uh, the Portland fan base is is massive for both their men's and women's teams. Um, it's hard to get a ticket, and they are you know educated football fans, which. It doesn't always happen in the U.S., but they are, you know, very loud, very um, in tune with the nuances of the game. So in Portland's the absolute best for, for, for club football on the women's side. And internationally, I think, it, you know, looking back on my career in 2011, when we played in the World Cup final against Japan, of course, we lost in penalty kicks. So that was a bit traumatic, but um, the atmosphere of that game was absolutely lights out. It was in Frankfurt, Germany, and Germany just put on a show that entire World Cup, obviously a football-loving country. And, um, yeah, I just remember being on the field and having one of those moments of, of telling myself to kind of look around, take it in, because this was uh, – it was a breathtaking scene. Well, it clearly meant a lot to Joaquin to have his family watching him in the stadium – they would have had to travel there, obviously, but uh, the families of Pat and Heather don't have to go to any effort to listen to them appear on world football, so there's no excuse. Join us again next week. Goodbye till then. Goodbye. Goodbye. World Football is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service.